Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Father Robert Nixon, who is the, uh, well, the translator of two books, The Paradise of the Soul, 42 Virtues to Reach Heaven, as well as uh, The Battle of the Virtues and Vices Defending the Interior Castle of the Soul. This one is by Pope St. Leo IX, and the first uh, is by St. Albert the Great, St. Thomas Aquinas' teacher. Um, if you're seeing this video on YouTube, you're seeing it about two days after the premium subscribers who have either YouTube memberships or are subscribed as a paid subscriber to my Substack. Um, one of the promises I give to my premium subscribers is that these sort of long form videos and interviews, you'll have access to them beforehand, um, which is part of the perks, so to speak. Uh, I don't like doing the selling myself thing too much, so I'm not going to talk too long here. But I just wanted to set that message out there. And uh, if you are enjoying this video as a premium subscriber before everybody else, thank you very much for your support and for all of the other, all other, all the other people who aren't premium subscribers. I hope you enjoy it as well. And uh, just wanted to keep that in mind. All right, enjoy the show. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, or evening. I am recording here from Southwestern Ontario with Father Nixon from Western Australia. So as we record this, it is 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it is 9.30 a.m. Would you call it Western Australian time? Is that the time zone? Yeah, it is. In fact, it's 10.30 a.m. here at the moment. So Oh, it's 13. Okay, so we're time traveling right now, which is pretty fascinating. I've never been able to do that before. So... Mm. Um, uh, so I'm just going to read a quick biography here, ladies and gentlemen. So Father Nixon, having studied composition, musicology, philosophy, literature, and education, wow, that's pretty fascinating. And after working for a period as a professional musician and educator, uh, he enter, uh, entered the diocesan seminary in Queensland, where he studied theology through ACU, gaining the faculty medal, as well as directing the NNIBS. He also serves as liturgy coordinator to the monastery. He is a fellow of Trinity College of Music, London, and the London College of Music, University of West London, and an, an uh, academi Academico ad Honorem of the Academia Philharmonica di Bologna. Oh, it's Italian. Okay. He has served as an advisor to Arts Queensland and a board member of James Cook University. So we might say Father Nixon's a bit of a Renaissance man with his background there. <laughs> um, well, first, Father, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, Kennedy. And how are you doing? I'm living the dream. I have my wife is expecting our sixth baby uh, in 29 days, um, and I've yeah, my oldest is eight years old. So we've got a pretty busy household. <laughs> yes, yeah. well, congratulations on your growing family. Thank you. Now I have to ask. Um, I am going to stereotype the Aussie here. I'm a massive rugby fan. And I know uh, it's a little bit of a sport in, uh, in Australia with league and union. Did you play growing up? Are you yeah. a fan of either one? Yeah, yeah, I, I did. I did. I'm from North Queensland, and we're strictly, in those days, we were strictly a rugby league That's right. uh, place. And so rugby league is the, the code of football, which I understand. That's a very simple code. Grab the ball, run until someone knocks you over, then repeat six times and then the other team gets the ball and so that's how it goes it's, it's a the, fun game but very the, rough is it the cowboys the queensland cowboys and the nrl is that the team there the, the north queensland cowboys indeed yeah. i my heart still supports that team although i no longer live in that part of the country so yeah well so, done for knowing that one by the way well i'm uh i, I used to play i never played a league they, they don't really have league in canada it's mainly union um, and I played uh, some men's league and things like that. I coached high school teams and, and um, oh, what was the player? I used to watch him on the Sydney Rabbitohs. He was English, but he was there with his brothers as well um, when they won the league back in like 2012 or something like that. What was his name? The big English fella. Anyway. Uh, English. Um, hmm. It's Blanken. He plays, he was from the Bradford I'm, I'm... area in England, but uh, anyway, it's Blanken. All right. Yeah. But anyway, that's that's wonderful. Um, well, we're not here to talk about rugby as much as I would love to talk about it the whole show, as I'm sure I could. We're here to talk about two books that Father Nixon has translated. The first is The Paradise of the Soul, and this is by St. Albert the Great, which is 
a little serendipitous because his feast day just passed. And the other is Virtues and Vices uh, by Pope St. Leo IX. And these are the first time they've been put in English. Is that correct? Uh, well, almost correct. There was an earlier translation of the Paradise of the Soul, but uh, the language was very outdated and it wasn't a completely accurate translation. So I felt it was timely to, uh, to retranslate this great work. Well, I can tell you, um, they're really, really good translations. I, um, I just narrated uh, Anthony Esselin's con uh, translation of Confessions for Tan, and he did an excellent job of, uh, of translating, and you as well, taking this sort of ecclesial kind of Latin and putting it into this. Uh, it's modern in the sense of it's easy for the North American reader to understand, but it doesn't feel modern, if that makes sense. It feels like a sort of classic 20th century English. So my hats are off you, off to you for doing that. Yeah. Uh, th th thanks very much, Kennedy. And uh, I think that's so important in translating Latin to remember that when people wrote in Latin, they weren't just writing in their everyday vernacular speech. So there was a degree of formality and polish about the language, which of course I try to reproduce in the English rendering. Have you ever spent any time reading uh, the Ronald Knox translation of the Bible, as a side note? I, you know, I, I have. And in fact, I I really admire that translation. It um, It's it's quite literal, it's quite faithful, but it's also, um, she uses a particular idiom of, of, of English, which I, which I think is very effective um, to read and reflect upon, and for liturgical use as well. I think it's so important um, that in our liturgy, in our sacred writings, we remember that we're not just having a conversation with our next door neighbor, that there is a degree of formality in the language, a sacred, uh, sacred language, without overdoing it, without becoming incomprehensible. So I think the uh, the Knox translation of the Bible uh, had a great has a great deal to recommend it. Yeah, I really enjoy the New Testament of it. Uh, it's uh, the way he wrote it was very. It was almost like Christ spoke like an Englishman, but in the very, in the sort of uh, I don't know the Oxfordian era of the C.S. Lewis's of the world. It kind of sounded like he would have translated it. I always thought it was quite good. But um, yes, absolutely. So you have a background in music. Um, and you found yourself in a Benedictine setting. Um, did John Sr. and his work have anything to do with your uh, sort of spirituality or, or journey to there? Um, no, I, I can't say that what that, that did. Really what drew me to Benedictine life was um, when I felt called to serve the church, my first step was to train to become a diocesan priest for my home diocese back in North Queensland, because I knew plenty of diocesan priests and I, I knew that the work they did was so important and valuable. Um, during that course of that time, living in the seminary community, I got a sense of the beauty of living in a religious community, uh, saying the divine office regularly together and everything. And uh, out of that, I came to um, to discern that it was monastic life that I was called to. I came for a retreat over here to New Norcia, and New Norcia is uh, the oldest religious community in Australia. It's uh, like a little bit of um, medieval Spain in the outback Australian desert. So I was tremendously uh, enthralled by it. And um, after a difficult discernment, I decided to leave my home diocese and to uh, to become a monk here. So what's the process like then? So the diocesan seminary is usually, let's say, seven years. Um, becoming yeah. a priest within the uh, the Benedictines, is it sort of the same amount of formation as, or what, what's the what's different about it? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it is the same formation, um, but in the Benedictine order, of course, a person can't be ordained until they've completed their solemn profession until they made that lifelong commitment. So for me, I'd already completed my academic studies in the seminary, but um, I then had to go through the process of novitiate, simple profession, temporary profession, and then solemn profession before being ordained. 
Um, in the past, people would have done their studies within the monastery. And we've got a, a tremendous library here of 80,000 books covering all the fields. But now it would be difficult for us to train a, a person to meet the canonical academic requirements. So we, we would probably send them away to a seminary for a few years if we had a candidate uh, reputable. Yeah, a lot of people aren't aware that seminaries, as we understand them, are sort of uh, uh, a development after the Council of Trent um, to meet the sort of demand of the confusion going on and sort of standardize the training. But for the first millennia and a half or so of the church, it was uh, more of a almost like an apprenticeship sort of thing. You know, you spend time with the order or with the parish priest, and eventually, after it's sort of deemed you're ready, you'd be ordained. That's correct. Is is that correct? It, it, that, that, that's that's correct, and that actually persisted with um, priests in monasteries that they wouldn't necessarily go away for studies, but they would generally do their studies within their monastery or within their own friary of whatever order they happen to be a part. Um, but these days, not many monasteries are able to provide that course of studies, apart from those monasteries which actually run seminaries and. There are still a few of those in existence in North America, for example, there are seven. Okay, so we know you have a background in music. Um, now, I do. I speak Spanish, French, and Italian, so I can kind of pretend to know what I'm talking about when I'm reading some Latin. Um, but I've tried to uh, understand the declensions and all this kind of stuff, and it's, it's oh, not yeah. as easy as other things. Yeah. So how did you get to the point where yeah. you were comfortable being a not only you know a priest who uses latin texts but to translate it so well well um for people from a new classical music background tend to be familiar with a whole bunch of different languages because different titles directions so um french italian spanish um latin texts as well so i kind of knew a bit of all of these um to understand them reasonably okay uh, but then at a certain point after I entered the seminary, I became determined to read Latin uh, fluently, as they did throughout the Middle Ages, you know, and until quite recently. And I knew it was something that was perfectly possible for, for anyone to do, um, because so many thousands had done it in the past. And I sensed it was something that the church needed because it was dying out and is dying out at a very rapid rate. Um, so I immersed myself in it. I deliberately forgot about Spanish, Italian, um, French, because I found I got confused because those languages are so similar. You know, uh, I use an Italian word instead of a Latin word or a Spanish word instead of a Latin word. Um, so I, 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 you know, I, I did the courses, but more importantly, I just spent a lot of time reading scripture, um, Thomas Aquinas, classics, relatively simple texts but um if you do enough reading uh with simple texts you eventually become fluent um and it's not to say I'm, I'm the most perfect latinist in the world but um i i can read it and understand it comfortably um as if it's a, a kind of home language for me and um i think the church actually does really need this uh at this point in time because seminarians today of, in most seminaries, I guess they do the canonically required one or two semesters of Latin, but they don't actually immerse themselves in it to become comfortable with it. And I think this is so important um, to read Thomas Aquinas, to read St. Augustine, to understand them in the original. Um, I think, you know, this is, this is a real duty of people who are becoming professional representatives of our of our Latin Rite Church. And it, it's still the Latin Rite Church, despite the fact that uh, the vernacular might be commonly used in the liturgy. Um, Latin is still our home language. For us, it's, it's, it's what Arabic is to Muslims, um, or Sanskrit is to Hindus. You know, uh, we clergy people, religious people, religious scholars need to learn it. You know, it's, it's fascinating. Um, I've been going to the traditional mass, you know, exclusively for probably, I don't know, five years. And, um, 
every time I go in for anything at the at the church, whether it's benediction or First Friday devotion or Mass on Sunday or whatever it is, as soon as I start hearing the Latin and looking at my missile, um, it al- it almost feels like uh, oh, I'm, I'm speaking my mother tongue, if that makes sense. Like I'm obviously not saying it, but there's something to it. There's just a, a level of uh, calmness that comes over, at least in my experience. Do you find that, like, have, having become so fluent in it? Yeah, yeah, yes, I, I do very much. And the sense that this is connecting us with the whole history of our church. And, um, you know, people use the argument that no one understands it. Well, in fact, it's actually pretty easy to understand. You think throughout the Middle Ages, peasants understood what was going on in the Mass. It, it's no big deal, really, and people sometimes imagine it's this great, uh, you know, stumbling block. But I think that was actually a political invention that it stops people from understanding it, because the essential parts of the mass, the Eucharistic prayer and so forth, they're the same each week. Um, so it doesn't. You don't have to be a genius to get to understand what it is, and and the very fact that it's the same kind of sacralizes it gives it this sense of eternity. I think one of the problems of using English in the vernacular is every few years you're bound to change it to keep up to date with the current idiom. And um, every time a translation is made, it reflects something of the perspective of the culture of the ideology of the translator. Um, So I think that is, you look at the difference between our current English missile and the one before it, you think, well, these were supposed to be translations of the text, but in fact, they're quite different in tone, in meaning. So I, I you know, I, I think there's a good case for retaining the Latin. And if we read the Vatican II documents, it actually says that it is assumed that Latin is going to be retained with a number of exceptions where the vernacular may be used. Yeah, exactly. There, yeah, where it may be, it doesn't have to be used. I just, I also narrated... Um, Dr. Kwasniewski's book on good music, sacred music, and silence. And uh, he did a masterful, it's a TAN book as well, ladies and gentlemen, you can find that at TAN. And he did a masterful job of um, making the traditional Catholic case, but showing that it was quite easily made by following the recommendations of Sacrosanctum Concilium about the liturgy, which I thought was, I mean, he's such a great scholar that he was able to do that. Um, But it's astounding when you read through the council documents about um, the, the affirmations of the retention of the traditional prayers and songs and language of the church. My children, my oldest is eight years old. They can't serve low mass quite yet. They're just, I mean, they can, I shouldn't say that. They can, but they just can't do the responses. So the the second server will do the responses, the older child. Um, But, you know, we say the rosary and they go back and forth between Pater Noster and whatever they want to do. And it just took a couple lessons with mom in the schoolroom, a couple mornings and they got it. You know, if my little seven-year-old can can pray in latin so can a a grown man with a university education it's not that hard for people but um um exactly okay so let's let's dive in quickly here by the way ladies and gentlemen these books again the first is virtues and vices uh by pope saint leo the ninth and the paradise of the soul by uh, albert the great and these are wonderful for meditation i was reading them this morning as part of my my morning reading and uh, much like Imitation of Christ or, or uh, True Devotion to Mary, something like that, that you can just pick up, you can open it up and you can chew on something and just put it away and then pray about it. These are perfect for that. I recommend them for everybody, um, especially with Advent coming up. Maybe do an Advent challenge where you're thinking I'm going to do a holy hour or 10 minutes of meditation in the morning or something like that. I recommend these. Um, so let's go through this one here I find so fascinating, The Paradise of the Soul, because St. Albert the Great, we hear about a Thomas Aquinas all the time, but we forget that there, it's like, what's a good analogy? I, well, this is a North American analogy, but we all, we all know about Tom Brady, but Bill Belichick was his coach. Okay, so we know about Thomas Aquinas, but he had a teacher. And if you can teach Thomas Aquinas, you're probably pretty smart. So could you tell us a little bit about Albert the Great in this work? Yeah, so uh, Albert the Great was uh, was a German he was showed exceptional intelligence at a young age. And um, it came about that he wasn't sure, of, he knew that he wanted to serve the church. He had a vision of the Virgin Mary who instructed him 
to join the Order of Preachers, which was a very new order at that stage, had only been going for a few decades. Um, so he went into that and um, immediately he became outstandingly known for the depth and breadth of his knowledge. He, he earned the nickname The Great while he was still alive, which is pretty amazing when you think about it, and regarded as the most learned man of his time. So sending Thomas Aquinas, who was um, a youth who showed exceptional potential, sending him to uh, Albert the Great as a student was a natural step for the Dominicans to take. And Thomas Aquinas, uh, sorry, Albert the Great actually wrote more than Thomas Aquinas. His collected works are, um, are massive, I mean, incredibly enormous. And they cover not just theology, but also areas like astronomy, um, botany, geology, zoology, um, a whole bunch of different areas. So he was literally a person who, who studied every field of science that was available at the time. And um, it's unfortunate that not too many of his works have been translated into English at this stage. In fact, only a very small percentage of his works. And I think the reason is when people think about the, the size of the project, they just, you know, throw up their hands and think it would be faster to learn Latin for anyone who wants to read this than to translate it. And um, yeah, but uh, he, he's a, actually a wonderful author. And um, I plan on translating more of his works in the future. Well, I was going to say there's a not we obviously you're employed, but as a joke, I would say there's lots to keep you gamefully employed if there's a lot to be translated by uh, Albert the Great. Um, so there's a there's a couple there's two or three chapters in here. I thought we could talk about because this is this. But by, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, this book is about 42 virtues to reach heaven. So obviously um, uh, what happens here is you basically go through about seven, eight pages each and you have about these virtues and it's very practical very easy to understand advice about what these are what goes against these virtues how do you cultivate them and there's three that i think maybe four that i think are so important for catholics today and it's the virtues of simplicity holy silence solitude and contemplation and the reason i think that is because simplicity our lives are so complicated we have so many contact things going on at all times. We've got little machines buzzing at us 24 hours a day. Um, the holy silence, we don't spend any time in silence. You know, I have, on the other side of my camera, I have a sound booth that I record audiobooks in, and it's just an insulated room. It's basically like a little bomb shelter. And um, But I go in there and I close the door and I have no sound on. And I forget how important silence is. So that's important. Solitude. Um, we're isolated today because we're not connecting like we did, but there's a virtue of solitude, which I don't think people would understand. So I think that's important. And the last one is contemplation. So that's a lot I'm asking you to comment on there, but um, maybe you could give us your thoughts on, on this necessity to sort of simplify and have a quieter, a quieter yeah. soul, if that makes sense. Uh, ab absolutely. Um, so, you know, Albert the Great was a fantastic observer of human nature. Um, and this comes from, as I mentioned before, he was interested not only in theology, but also in, in natural science. So he took the approach of observing critically and, and looking for patterns and everything. So he was able to distinguish between genuine simplicity and false simplicity, signs that it's going well and not going well. And he did this through years of experience as a novice master, as, as a teacher of, of young Dominicans. Um, and he talks about this simplicity um, is something we find exemplified in Job. It's, it's not bearing extraneous negative thoughts, distractions, animosities, envies, bitterness, and so forth. Um, so simplicity, he says here, if a person really loves simplicity, he will not permit himself to be occupied by a multitude of earthly concerns. An example of being uh, of the error of being occupied with many things is given to us in Martha. And we think about 
you know, there are so many things in this world which can distract us, which can occupy our thoughts, and they take us away from this single-minded um, intensity of purpose, which should be, of course, to serve God. And the devil tempts us not only by, you know, allurements, temptations in that sense, but also in the form of distractions and unnecessary anxieties. And while these things might not be sins in themselves, they do serve to turn our attention away from God. And so in that way, they, so I think the cult, this cultivation of simplicity, we should look at what is occupying our life and our mind. And thinking, well, is there anything unnecessary there? Anything which I, you know, can can get rid of, can say no to. And I think part of the struggle with modern people um, in our culture is that there's this fundamental feeling of emptiness, which people try to fill by means of distractions, concerns, activities, and so forth. And of course, the world, um, all the forces of commercialism and so forth are keen to exploit that, to make us feel that, yeah, we, we do need all these distractions. And um, I think so, so this deliberate cultivation of simplicity of life from time to time, especially Lent and Advent, very opportune times for, for cutting back on our range of, of activities and concerns. You know, this is something that is so difficult for us today in the church where obviously, you know, we wouldn't say we're living in a golden age and there's things that we want to know because, you know, we're worried about this or that coming out of Rome or what's going to happen in the diocese or whatever. I mean, there's all the things people know. Um, and there is this line that is easily crossed between, for example, as a father of a family, okay, there's things I want to be aware of. I got to raise my children in the faith. I got to make sure we got a good parish and and to get my kids to heaven, that's that's my job. So I got to be aware of certain things, but at the same time, we're not. It's not natural for us to live in a twenty-four hour news cycle. And the same thing is true in in secular society. I mean, you're in Australia, I'm in Canada. Our governments, they were a little bit zealous when it came to the whole COVID thing. Let's put it that way, and um, that was difficult to live through. And but it was, you know. If I were observing that from 30,000 feet, uh, whether someone was sort of for the government narrative or against the government narrative, either way, everyone was attached to the latest development coming out of the government and of the whoever, the expert, because it was almost like governing by announcement. It was governing by social media posts, and it was so unhealthy for people, myself included. Um, yeah. Yeah, that was just bad. <laughs> I, I think that's very true. I think that, that news can actually become like a kind of entertainment, like a soap opera. And, you know, um, my, myself, some Benedictine monks, I mean, I don't follow the news very closely at all. And, you know, if the Prime Minister of Australia was to change, it would probably be a month before I would realise. And I can honestly say it wouldn't make the slightest difference to how I actually live my own life. And um, there's a whole bunch of things. You know, the way I, my, my religious life and everything, I don't really need to know what's going on in Rome. Um, I mean, I, I guess if there's something important, it will eventually come through to me. But I don't need to know on a daily basis, you know, um, who said what or whatever. Um, and I think there's there's a good case for thinking to live our life focusing on what's at hand, the people who are at hand, the actual issues uh, which affect our, our our life, rather than looking at things uh, in this kind of massive global perspective, when all we're doing is just tapping into another form of entertainment, because it really doesn't make that much difference to us. And... Um, you know, I, you know, I think there's people have this this wrong sense that they need to stay up to date with everything. I think when we need to be up to date, we'll be informed. Um, uh, until then, it's okay to kind of be off the grid a little bit. And I think there's a good case with that. I think people should look, everyone should look at 
how much time they're spending on social media and so forth and thinking, well, is this really a profitable engagement of my time or my energy? And what would happen if I cut it out? Probably nothing. So, yeah, there's very know, it's few. A, it's an opportunity. Yeah, there's very few it's people. It's an opportunity who, to regain time. That's right. There's very few people who really make their living, so to speak. Um, and that's something, if I'm being honest, I've had to try to sort out for myself. You know, I, I, I was a school teacher. And sadly, the Catholic schools in this province, it's, you know, basically I was run out of town for being too Catholic. And, um, uh, so I've sort of fallen into this career of being an author, uh, whatever, found myself in front of a camera and okay, I can make a living for my family. Um, but if I could, I would, if I could snap my fingers and get rid of, uh, the internet <laughs> or something, I don't know. I think I'd kind of like to do that. It's like, it's an internal struggle. I'm thinking, am I producing things that are going to make people attached to their phones but at the same time, they're going to be on their phones, so it's better they get something that's edifying. It's a constant interior battle. So maybe pray for me that yeah. I figure it out. But okay. yeah. yeah, well, and, and and the thing is, Kennedy, that we, you know, it's all a, a question of balance and just doing what seems to be best to us. Of course, we can never tell with absolute certainty about these things. Um, and of course, there's a lot of good which comes through the availability of communication and so forth. So, um, so you know, I don't want to be like dogmatic about it, but it, I think it, the key is moderation here. Okay, um, moving on to <clears throat> the virtues and vices book, um, the battle for the uh, the defend the it says it's the battle of the virtues and vices defending the interior castle of the soul, and um, again, ladies and gentlemen, these are available in the description box for this video, or if you're listening on. Spotify or iTunes, one of those platforms, it's in the description thing there as well. Um, one of the things, because I know we only have about, about 10, 15 minutes. I said I'd keep you for 40, 45. So um, the one thing that I wanted to ask you about, this caught my eye as reading this book this morning. Um, detraction is refuted by just correction. So in this age of social media and this age of journalism, there is a lot of detraction and calumny that goes on. Um, I know I've been a newsman for yeah. a number of years, reporting and stuff for LifeSite News and other places. There is a line between reporting the news or tearing somebody down. And we all experience it. I've experienced it, especially as a public person. And then there are people who we know who are, let's say, spreading falsehoods about the faith, etc. So... How should we deal with, well, for one, to not be detract, not be detracting people, sort of maybe some keys for us not to fall into that sin. And at the yeah. same time, when we receive it, yeah. how, do we, how do we deal with that? So I think uh, this awareness that detraction is actually a sin is so important. There's a, you know, a lot of people don't even realize it's a sin. So in the same way that if we were to hurt someone physically, if we were to go and, you know, punch someone or kick them, of course, it would be a sin. If we hurt someone's reputation or standing by saying things about them, then it's actually a sin. We're, we're doing them damage. Now, of course, there is a difference between um, criticizing someone's ideas or actions and actually detracting from the person. So uh, to give you an example, there might be a politician whose actions you don't agree with then. And so you've got a right to criticize their their beliefs, their actions, um, but that doesn't mean you have a right to criticize them as a human being. And often I think we we cross this line unknowingly. You know, um, you think about people who don't like Biden, who, who don't like his ideas, who don't like what he stands for, who don't like what he does. Yeah, that's fair enough, and that's quite correct. Um, but from that, it doesn't necessarily follow that you, you need to put him down as a human being. Um, and the same with the other side. You know, Trump, there were a bunch of people who didn't agree with what he did, uh, his, his ideas, but doesn't need that you need to detract from them as a human being. And I think this is so important. We look at the way that the disagreements of the past took place amongst different theologians. Sure, they disagreed about ideas, but they didn't use hateful language 
about them the other person personally and i think this is so important that we recognize this when we when we're starting to use hateful personal language or to criticize a person's personality or their intelligence or their capabilities rather than focusing on the ideas and the issues at hand so um, yeah i think we all need to pull ourselves up about this detraction thing and um when we hear detraction from others um i think it's it's uh, you know not to correct them saying you know but on the to turn the conversation towards the issues towards the substance towards the ideas and actions rather than the persons involved yeah so uh, this is this is so important not only in in public life but also in private life you know we encounter people with whom we're in conflict or have different ideas um and on a personal level to treat them with respect and kindness this doesn't mean we have to agree with their ideas uh but you know the the call to human charity and human fraternity is is in fact universal so it is a difficult one uh kennedy and definitely one that i think we need to think about um all of us need to think about in this day and age I've talked when I was talking to a priest about what's the difference between gossip and which is a sort of a subset of detraction or it's part of it's if there's if there's yeah. gossip if there's gossip there's detraction put it that way um and he said you know this is kind of the analogy it's kind of like that 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 analogy people say what's the difference between something like a classical piece of art that is has nudity in it that's in sort of the renaissance or pre-renaissance period or the classical period which we know instinctively, we see it, we understand that it's tasteful. But then there's a difference between that and sort of a pornographic image, obviously. And everyone just knows a line's been crossed by how it makes them feel. <laughs> and with detraction, I mean, if you have a friend, let's say, who's going through a difficult period, and you're concerned about that friend, you'll know when you're speaking about that friend with another friend out of concern because you care about the person. And you'll know when you're speaking about that person to sort of throw rocks at them. And you might even be saying the same words, but it can just depend on how you're saying it. You know, so-and-so, well, did you hear so-and-so? His wife cheated on him. Well, that's very different than, oh no, did you hear about so-and-so? I, I, I fear his wife has cheated on him. Like it's a very different way of saying it. One of them is sort of, let's yeah. want to tell stories. The other one is I care about them. Exactly. It's a question of motivation. And if we have the right motivations, um, you know, of of helping people, of of charity, of justice, and so forth. Then it's not so much, you know, what we say, but the reasons we say it. And when it becomes either just entertainment, um, or if it's motivated by anything malicious, then we've crossed the line. And I think with uh, with the question of gossip, you know, it's a very important thing in Benedictine life. Uh, St. Benedict in the Rule talks about not grumbling, not murmuring. Within our Benedictine communities, we we seldom talk about other monks to each other, um, as strange as that might seem. And when we do talk about other people, we, we do it on the assumption that there's no confidentiality, that anything we could say can be said uh, publicly. I think, you know, as as a general rule, it's probably a good idea for most people to to pursue that policy of, you know, not talking about other people except when they really need to. Um, basically, it comes down to minding one's own business, I suppose. And this doesn't exclude charity and so forth. But, you know, if, if a person, if a fellow parishioner is doing a bunch of weird things, you might need to tell someone if it, you know, if it's really useful to tell them. If it's either going to help the person concerned or it's a issue of concern to the community but if it's just as an item of news or entertainment then then no keep quiet about it i think so uh, so as you as you said it's a question of of our motives and the reason we're doing this and also with gossip when we hear gossip you know we have the option of of not responding it uh, or we have the option of egging it on by asking questions and passing it on so you know, I think um, we need to be careful of this this gossip, this tendency 
to speak about other people's affairs when they don't properly affect us. Yeah, St. Philip Neri, there's a story um, about gossip and detraction. And he, there was a woman who was, he was her confessor as a priest in Rome, you know, 500 years ago, whenever. And um, she was having a hard time understanding the nature of gossip. My mother's an Italian immigrant. I can tell you a lot of Italian women have a difficulty understanding the nature of gossip. Okay, I'll stop. But, um, uh, you know, he he said to her, um, what I want you to do is I want you to go to the market and I want you to get a chicken for me. But I want you to pluck the chicken for supper. I want you to pluck the chicken on your way back to me. Let's call it a two kilometer walk. And then uh, present the chicken to me when I get here. She, this is weird. Okay, I'll do what you say, father. On the way home, she's plucking the chicken and all the feathers are all over the streets, whatever. Maybe that wasn't so weird in uh, sort of medieval Renaissance Rome. And um, he gets to her and then, or she gets to him and he says, I'd like you to go and get all the feathers and put them back. And immediately she understood that that was the problem with gossip. Even if you apologize to the person, the cat is out of the bag, so to speak. And it's very difficult, if not impossible, to put all the feathers back. So it's a good reminder for us. Yeah, it is. And gossip detraction can do great damage to a person's reputation and feelings and so forth. Um, so, it, so it is, you know, it is like punching or, or kicking someone. It is actually doing an act of violence towards them. And so we need to, you know, pull ourselves up and I think, you know, question ourselves frequently, saying, am I, do, am I doing these things? Because these are the sins which we can fall into doing and we only realize afterwards that, oh, you know, I went too far with this. So um, to be mindful of, of, our, of this tendency. Yeah, that's wonderful advice. And ladies and gentlemen, I recommend everyone click the link in the description box for this video or podcast, wherever you're watching or listening. And, um, you know, these are good books for Lent or Advent. Well, both, but Advent's coming up and um, it's good to prepare our souls for the coming of Christ into the world. And, uh, you know, if you're not a huge reader, this Virtues and Vices, this is a nice short book. It's very, uh, I don't mean it's easy in the sense of it's not meaningful, It's but it's very readable. Like my, my wife is homeschooling and she's expecting and whatever. And, you know, if she can find four minutes to read in the morning, that's a win. And the four minutes with this book right here will get you. And if you're someone who has a little bit more time, um, I would recommend this book by St. Albert the Great because... Um, you can spend 15 or 20 minutes kind of going over one of these chapters. It's, it's, I would say it's a little bit more philosophical than the book um, by the Pope. Um, obviously, Albert the Great being a great theologian and so forth. So, and there's, you know, especially in this age of the church, when we're confused about all these things, um, if we want to have a healthy church, yes, there's things that have to happen and that's in God's hands. But, you know, we have to be holy. There's no other solution. If there's a fulcrum and it's tipping towards hell. We've got to tip that thing towards heaven. And the only thing we can control, uh, at least to a degree, is our own is our own households and holiness. So, um, Father, I thank you for coming on this show. I really appreciated the conversation. Um, I always I always enjoy talking to people who spell color with a U, um, because uh, it's nice to know when somebody has the right uh, dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks, Kennedy. And it's been a pleasure sharing. And I recommend to your listeners these two books on the virtues and the vices, because as you said, the battle to win this world for God begins with a battle within our own hearts and from there spreads outward to the whole world. Wonderful. Father, would you be able to give us a blessing before we sign off here? Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Leo IX, St. Albert the Great, and our Holy Father, St. Benedict, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you always. Thank you, Father. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, check the links in the description area for this video and podcast, and you will find these books. And this has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless you all.